everybody. Welcome to the first episode of Fret Friends here on the Kenny Lee Lewis uh, YouTube channel. Today, I'm going to start out with, as you could hear from that opening, some Northern California influence, Latin blues, you know, sort of stuff that was going on during the classic era at the Fillmore in the 60s and 70s. And started out with the, the theme from Oye Como Va at the top there, but then went into some of my stuff. And uh, I can break that down as we go. A uh, little history on me, if you're just getting to know me, I was born in L.A., but I was raised in Sacramento as a kid all through my school years, so my influences were coming mainly from the pirate radio station KSAN, uh, Tom Donahue station coming out of San Francisco. Used to come up the Delta, and I could pick it up in Sacramento, and that's where I first heard people like, you know, Carlos and, you know, Credence, and, of course, Steve Miller, and uh, a lot of the other groups that were coming out of that area at that time. This is about 1967 in that area. But anyway, my influences came from an English blues background. I basically, of course, like everybody else, was first hearing the Yardbirds and the Kinks and, you know, even the Dave Clark Five, the Monkees. And of course, I liked the Beatles too, but they were just kind of different to me. They didn't really approach the guitar the same way that I'd like to do it. So I kind of leaned more towards the Yardbirds with Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page and those people. So I didn't really hear real blues until a guy moved next door to me. You know, I think that was around 66, 67. And he came over to my house and said, hey, I got, a, I got a guitar and amp. Come over to my bedroom and I'll play this record. And he pulls out this record. It's got this black guy on it with this little do-rag on his head. And he's got this really weird looking guitar. And it's electric mud. It's muddy waters. <laughs> and I'd never heard this kind of music because at those days, I mean, even though civil rights were kind of starting to get it together, they still were not playing that kind of music on the regular radio stations, at least in Sacramento. But you'd hear those things like on KSAN, which was really nice. So I finally started getting the proper education about that. You know, people like Steve and, and Carlos years later would, would tell me, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we started out with that stuff. So <laughs> getting back to what we were just playing, um, I was playing over sort of a Latin loop here. And uh, just sort of, you know, kind of playing these pentatonic scale, but there's more than just five. I mean, you're doing the two, you're kind of glancing off the flat five and the sharp five and things like that. So there's a little more going on to it than just the straight up, you know. That's your pentatonic blue scale. Well, this will probably have notes like... like that you know that's always a fun one one thing about Carlos he always liked to come in on the two or the nine of the scale like you'd be in like be in a minor and he'd always come in on because it sounded different it was it was not your normal note you would come in on on regular blues so that was kind of his entrance point into saying hey this is going to be something that's maybe a little more European Latin sounding so for you beginning players that are just starting to learn the scale that's something to consider. Uh, we'll also talk about relative major to minor uh, scales against each other. Now, I apologize for the tone right here. The tone that you heard when you first listened to this clip, that was just an amp, no pedals, turned up really nice, but I had this uh, vocal mic turned off. And because I can't switch it on and off right now, basically you're gonna get this ambient. You're gonna get that ambient sound while I show you things, but. It could be worse. <laughs> I'm still getting this all together. I don't have a basement, so I can't put my amps down in a basement. So, episode one here, Latin uh, blues psychedelic rock from the Northern California area. Okay, as you notice, we started out with the Oye Como Va melody, which is, you know, basically the first three notes of the minor scale, and then up to the fourth, and then down to the two. That's that nine, two, what we were talking about, and then sliding up to the tonic. So most of you know this riff already that are good players that have played in bands. But if not, it's basically one, two, three, four, one. Three, four, one. Three, four. And then there's some other riffs. And then the other riff I was playing was kind of a thing I came up with. Um, one thing you notice about this playing, which sort of comes from a European sort of a background, you play like two riffs back to back. It's almost like uh, De Niro, you know, he says, you know, you're talking to me, you're talking to me, you're talking to me. You know, repeating that goes into the head and it really sticks with you. And it's like a hook. 
And so a lot of the riffs I was playing were two clusters in a row, which were the same things. And this was a uh, sort of an arpeggio I was playing that looks like this. Okay, so you can see, basically, coming down from there, we're just doing triads. This first one is in minor, of course, which is E, C, A. Index, middle, ring. Here's the same thing now, but on D, B, G. So index, ring, middle. Here's the next one, which is actually a D chord, with like a D7, we're starting on the C. C, A, F sharp. Same thing, index, middle, ring. And then we'll do the E minor first, which will be the B, the G, and the E. But because the chord progression is going from the one in minor to the two in major, which is minor to major, this, the third arpeggio, I put the major third in, so it goes, uh, that is C, and then A, to an F sharp, because we're here. We're on the four chord by that point, so it's... Which makes the changes for the major four chord. Now, if it was minor all the way across, like A minor to D minor, like a summertime kind of a feel, then you could do the F, because it would work, which would be... Your, see what I'm saying? But we're actually major, so it's got to be. So that's the reason why I put that in there. Of course, the last uh, arpeggio was minor, which was B, G, and E, which is minor. And so if you were to follow the scale on chords, it would be. But if you want to make that major as well, then you would go B, and then you'd go to G sharp, and then E. So the chords would be like. Or minor. But you can also take it to the major. Which would be. So those are things that you have to think about when you're listening to the chords. But if you just want it to be real simple and just do real simple triads, you'll still you can still get away with just the A minor, the G, the F major, and then just E minor. If you wanted to make it major on the end as well. So that's a kind of a fun riff to learn. Once again, it looks like this. The variable being the E major, which would be. If we learn all of our scales, you know, obviously A minor. That's the minor scale. But you also learn your major scale in C. You'll be able to use that C major scale to launch off into solos when you're in A minor. And then the same thing is opposite, that if you're playing in C major, I mean, Mr. Good Job in the City, you can actually play an A minor blues scale against that C. Let the good job in the city. See what I'm saying? So you can substitute a minor for a major key and a major for a minor key. The other one that I did uh, that was kind of fun is uh, playing as a C major seven position. And what you do is you just go a half step below. If you look close to the guitar neck here, here's the major seventh riff coming up from each third, starting with the index finger on the sixth fret, sliding up. Next group. Next group. Adding the 6-9 on top, which was the A and the D. So the whole thing looks like this. You can do that all with your index and your middle finger. 
just jump, just leapfrog over. And then what I did is I threw a, I threw an A and a D on top, which would have been a C six nine over A bass. So it sounded like this. And then I kind of drag that last one a little late. Upbeat. That's kind of a fun one, using major sevenths. You could throw in these kind of Carlos Santana-esque kind of fancy things using the nine, using a little bit of the, uh, you know, the, the, the flat five. So the same thing as bending, but just fret it. And then if you want to throw an A on top, that's kind of a jazzy riff where you play this thing. Here's the dragged flat fifth with the suspended A on top. Index goes all the way across these three strings. Ring comes over to the D string, playing the A note. And then what you do is you go over to the D with your ring and you slide that up. And then off. Watch the hand over here, the right hand. I'm doing this, I'm holding the pick here. And my middle finger is doing the picking on those other strings. is I'm picking the high A note with my middle finger. I'm playing the C note here on the fifth fret with my pick. So if you look at my fingers here, it looks like this. So you're always sustaining the A on top. That's an old trick that's been around jazz for a long time. Boogie woogie jazz, if you will. So anyway, that gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. It's been a really a great experience playing with Steve, who grew up with the same scales and stuff. He doesn't really deviate much from that scale, but what he does with it in the clusters and the little riffs that he picks are very tasty. And I was listening to him when I was a kid and I was like going, dang, that's pretty cool. And uh, you know, of course there was a lot of other people that were doing the same thing. I always loved, you know, people like Dave Mason. Of course, Terry Kath was amazing of Chicago. He was making it even more jazzy. But these were the people that were my influences growing up and it's not difficult stuff. I'm not playing like really advanced, super, you know, crazy lead stuff here. This is just stuff that you could do when you're sitting in with people at the bar or, or jamming on a weekend with friends. And you can dazzle them a little bit with a couple of these little accidentals, which is fun. And then another thing that I did that was kind of fun was uh, I went to the rear pickup and I, I did sort of like a Billy Gibbons sort of thing. You take your um, middle finger. And then what I do is I, I pick the low A string and I bounce off it so I start going which is pretty simple. But I move that up scale-wise, the two notes. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, tush, you know, the riff that they were doing at tush. But I'm not doing that, I'm just kind of going. You go to open. And if you put that in kind of like in the middle of the riff, because you're going like this. Like that kind of a stuff. So you can do that, just get kind of nasty. And then I was bucking. And bucking is where you take the pick tip and just kind of hold the tip. Hang on, let's see if I can just get that a little better. You hold the tip down a little bit. There you go. But you get your index finger and your thumb parallel. So this thumb and this index finger become kind of like parallel. So it's not like this. You're not like holding it like this. You're holding it where the thumb and the index finger curls around and it makes a nice flat sort of thing. So you can get this pick tip real close to the strings, but you got a lot of meat around that string and by doing that when you pick the string with that little tip while well, you got this high gain and you 
use the palm of your hand a little bit too to also stop the vibration of the string right down here by the bridge. Here's the um, harmonics. The pick being held with the index and the thumb being parallel and that pick just hanging out just a little bit. And then taking this meaty part of your palm and putting it right in front of the bridge on the string. And then coming down with this little point here and then bucking it off the back side right here of this meaty part on the thumb. So it sounds like this. And so what happens is you end up getting sort of a thing like this. Notice how I had to back off a little bit to find the harmonic. So I'm hitting the string, I'm playing the string, but I'm also killing it with the meat on my thumb here as soon as I hit it with that little tiny tip, tippity tip. Right there you start hearing that harmonic. Once you find that area, which is right down in here, right in between the two pickups on a Gibson, and uh, it'd be in a different spot on a Fender or something, but you're basically... And if I move my hand up and down the string here, I move that up and down, we get those different harmonics. I'm able to get those different uh, overtone series to pop out. And then when you bend them, there's a second harmonic and there's a third. That's the third on top, second harmonic, third harmonic. Now you can play a scale like that. And if you follow the pattern of that scale with your picking down here, a lot smaller is down here, of course, the width of the frets is condensed when you go f higher on the neck to be able to play those harmonics in a cluster. So do that same pattern, but much smaller down here, close to the bridge. So that's another little trick. And of course, you know, all the dogs in the neighborhood are like, Arr! you know, because they love all those high notes because it drives them nuts. Mandolin kind of stuff that you can also put in. And that's just sweet picking. And when you do that is sweet picking is done with your arm, not with your wrist. A lot of people think that the, you know, you're playing this fast stuff with your wrist. You're not. You're anchoring your elbow. So your whole arm is sort of like a, a phonograph arm and your your wrist is act, actually stiff you're not really moving you're not you're not like real stiff and, and what i do is i hold my pick i don't hold it when i do that kind of stuff i'll rotate my pick real quick and i'll play the side of the pick see that not the tip and that when that, what that does is it allows you to have a much broader area to roll over the string with without having to be so accurate with the tip so you can actually get a little more you get a little more um, real estate here on the edge and it's round, more round. And so you're able to get that kind of a thing. That's a mandolin technique. Again, it's coming from the, the elbow all the way down through the straight arm. Cause you know, whenever you're, doing, whenever you're doing that kind of stuff, that's basically your forearm. It's not anything your wrist is doing. All you're doing with this hand is just holding the pick and don't drop it. Kind of like bazooki Greek mandolin style. Carlos liked to do that. And so he'd be up here. And then he'd end on a high note or something, you know. Bill Graham always used to describe Carlos as being like the wind. That was the way that he described him to me when I asked him, what do you think of Carlos? He says, well, when he plays, it's like the wind, you know, just coming through. And, you know, you just see all these patterns and you feel all these different sensations. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. When you're doing this kind of stuff, hopefully you're changing the weather patterns. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you uh, got something from that. In the meantime, as you can see over my shoulder here, I have um, the dude. The dude's not been feeling too good lately, and so I just wanted to honor Jeff. I got to meet him. 
several years ago, our tour manager uh, introduced me to him, and I went and saw him here in town in San Luis Obispo, and got to go backstage, hang out, and we talked, and I met his daughter, uh, Jessie. She's fantastic. <laughs> she was fun to hang with. And so we talked a little bit because I've always had my hair down and had shades on and a beard. And I grew up in California, just like Jeff and Bo. And Bo, his brother, used to be in the Indian guides, the Indian princesses, as we call them now, with our, our daughters. And we used to go and do a lot of camping stuff together. So I knew Bo pretty good. And then when I met Jeff, you know, it was just like sort of full circle. I told him, I said, you know, you're a great actor. I said, you play, you know, the dude really well, but I am the dude. <laughs> I'm the real dude. He laughed. He says, well, you know, no, I'm the dude. You know, so we kind of went back and forth on that. But I'm, I'm lifting him up in prayer for his uh, challenges right now physically. And uh, what do you got to say there? Well, you know, sorry, Jeff. You know, I'm just trying to do the best I can. You know, I'm trying to abide. <laughs> anyway, I hope you're getting something from this. I'm having fun. Uh, like I said, I've been locked up since March. I've been kind of putting off doing this for a while. And as you could see by the trailer, if you watch the trailer, we're going to be doing all kinds of instruments. We're not just going to be doing guitar. Guitar is just some entry point that I can share with a lot of people because guitar obviously is very popular. But I'm going to be getting into a lot of bass stuff and then all these other fretted instruments. That's why we call this fret friends because we're all becoming friends of the fret through all kinds of different instruments. You know, we'll be doing bare tones and sitars and you know mandolins and you know even some lap steel and whatever and uh, we'll just get into all these different things that you can layer over a track to really really make your recordings have a lot more sparkle you can do a lot with guitar no doubts with a lot of pedals and everything i've got a few down here but i don't use a whole lot of pedals i mean that that opening thing you just heard that's just my magnetone i flip the top boost on it and just turn it up to about four and just you know humbuckings into an amp straight up you don't have to do much. It just sounds great. Uh, you don't want to have too big an amp. Like right now, I just have an 18 watt amp back here in the glass, but man, it's loud. <laughs> That's why I have to turn this mic off in order to get to sound decent. Once again, the gear, um, Carlos started out with uh, P90s on an SG Special at Woodstock. I think the first album was recorded that way. He was using a Boogie Mark I, you know, uh, I think it was just a 50 watt amp, you know, with a single 12. Basically, what I'm playing back here is not much different. This is a 20-watt magnetone. It compresses really nice, and you just turn it up. You don't have to do much to it. He eventually went to Humbuckers. I think he played a Les Paul for a little while, but he, he got into Paul Reed Smith pretty early, and so he's been with him forever. So he's basically a Gibson humbucking P90 guy. So if you're going to play this style, I mean, that's obviously the style, you know, the, the instrument you want. I'm using this 58 reissue. 335 just because the pickups sound great and they're kind of like period proper. Um, I could plug my SG in and it would be very similar, the one back there. The fenders will be different. I can overdrive them a little different to get sounds that are similar to this, but this is a lead guitar approach. You don't, you're not looking for super clean rhythm stuff. So when you're playing this lead kind of Northern California psychedelic Latin blues thing, you're probably going to want to use a Gibson and you're gonna want, to, or a guitar that just has a humbucker, particularly in the neck position, because that's gonna give you that really beautiful, rich, round sound. And then the rear pickup, yeah, it's just kind of fun if you're gonna use it, but it's just sort of a sound effects thing. The front pickup pretty much takes the brunt of this kind of style. Uh, if you are gonna use pedals, like right now, I do have a, a Tube Screamer, an 808, uh, you know, vintage up right now, just so I didn't have to have the amp so loud, so I could, so I could have some sustain. But this is artificial sustain, whereas the first stuff you heard was just an amp. And that's why it sounded really fat and nice. If you're live and you need that to go to your lead sound and you're playing clean all the time, yeah, you're going to need a pedal. So, you know, I would say either a, a, a clone clon, <laughs> a clon clone, or an OCD pedal, or maybe one of these uh, VR uh, TS-808 Ibanez tube screamers. They're all real warm, they sound great, and you get a really nice buddy, buttery lead sound. So that's pretty much it. Um, you can use a Marshall, you know, I mean, it's overkill. You're gonna be really loud once you turn that up. Even a 50 watt Marshall would be pretty loud with a four by 12. That's one of my other things I'll talk about in another episode is amp sizes. I don't think you really need to have gigantic amps to get great sounds, especially even playing live because a lot of times now we mic our amps and we put them through the PA, we put them through the, the monitors. 
and it sounds great and it'll get up over the the whole band you know without any problem you just have to have a good sound system so anyway that's pretty much it once again thanks a lot for tuning in if you like what you heard today and you like what's going on i'm going to be doing a lot more stuff this was just an introductory little thing to just say hi and get to know one another but please subscribe to the kenny lee lewis page here and then also like the video if you liked it and that helps me get my uh, numbers up because that's what this is all about is a numbers game. Again, say your, say your prayers for Jeff. I think he's going to be okay. You can go online and find out what's, uh, what's going on with him because I don't want to go into detail. That's his privacy. But for now, Jeff, what do you got, what do you got to say? Okay, all right. Well, election day tomorrow. Wow! <laughs> We're going to buy it. Oh, God. This aggression will not stand. Oh, good words, Jeff. Okay. So, anyway, signing off. Thanks a lot. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you around the backside, okay?